Well, this is uh, both a good question, but also a very important question that comes from Vivian. Vivian is a former Jehovah's Witness who, uh, who left the Watchtower, and uh, her concern is for those who are still in the Watchtower, but are very, very sincere in their faith. Uh, and as she describes them in her, her, uh, her comment, uh, they are passionate for God, they, um, you know, they, they sincere, they're sincere people, and very lovely people. I believe is the terminology she used and, and such and she's struggling with the idea that even with their sincerity and their you know seeming love for God and that it seems cruel that God would uh, allow them to go to hell even though they're very sincere and they they seem to love God in that I understand uh, and very much feel the, uh, the the desire in your heart to see them saved uh, I, I too have people in my life that are part of different religious systems that that they're very sincere about, but they have in fact rejected uh, the biblical Jesus or the gospel of uh, God's grace through faith and that. Um, uh, matter of fact, for those who are not terribly familiar with Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, and this would be true not only of Jehovah's Witnesses, but of other groups that we might cl classify as cults, those who claim to be true Christianity, but reject uh, and deny fundamental essential truths of the Christian faith. Again, things like the deity of Christ, or the triune nature of God, or a salvation by grace through faith. Um, things like this that are essential and fundamental to what it means to be a believer. Uh, groups like the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, reject these things. They believe that Jesus is a God, and even a mighty God, but not almighty God. Uh, by definition, that would make them polytheists, um, which they reject as well. But they, they reject the deity of Christ in any case. They also reject the idea that God is Father, Son, and Spirit, one being, yet eternally existing in three persons. This is admittedly something that no one can really explain uh, how it works, but that it's that it's evident in Scripture, again, is, is self-evident. I mean, it's, it's throughout the Scripture. And we can make this case for the triune nature of God based on his own revelation of himself throughout the Scripture. Um, but they will go to lengths, the Jehovah's Witnesses will, to um, provide literature and, and debate you on that point um, as hard as they can. Uh, they also are, by definition, a completely works-based system. They don't believe in the grace of God being sufficient. They believe that you have to work. As a matter of fact, the fact that they, you know, come knocking on your door uh, is an evidence of something they believe very firmly, and that is that you have to work toward your salvation. So um, these are very fundamental truths that if you hold... Uh, views uh, that are off in these areas, then you're not actually a Christian. And so um, this is an important thing. And these kinds of things have been around from the beginning. Uh, you think about Paul and his uh, constant uh, battles with the Judaizers uh, and the Gnostics too, but you see the Judaizers who believe that in order to come to Christ, you had to come through the law of Moses and you had to keep the law of Moses. Uh, he has such strong, breathtaking arguments against that thinking against that theology. Or John, for example. Uh, we think of John in the beginning of the Gospel, or his first epistle, with these lofty introductions to the person of Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, you know, and, and then in verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Um, these are, not, or first John, you know, that which we've seen with our eyes, uh, touched with our hands concerning the Word of life. These are not just lofty introductions to the person of Christ, they're apologetic arguments against Gnosticism at the time. And so um, these kinds of ideas that are just another variety of it is expressed through uh, uh, the views of the Jehovah's Witnesses or maybe the Mormons or the uh, uh, Christian scientists or Seventh-day Adventists and different things like this. Um, these groups all deny various elements, one or more of these things in regard to the Christian faith. And so therefore they, they qualify as cults. They're outside the pale of orthodoxy. Uh, but again, this is nothing new. Paul warned about the last days would be false teachers and, and that kind of thing, and so we should be aware of that. Um, so that being said, the fact that such arguments and such time and effort was put into defending against these things helps us to understand the importance of the truth. Jesus himself spoke about how the truth would set you free, right? And and uh, and it is the Son who ultimately sets you free. And we read about this in John, uh, John eight, um, or in John five, for example. We're just kind of quoting John quite a bit today. I've been reading him a bit, but uh, you see throughout the Gospel of John all of these claims to his deity, his exclusivity, and these kinds of things. 
Uh, well, in John chapter uh, 5, verse 39 and 40, you search the scriptures because it is in them that you think you have eternal life, but it is they that speak of me, but you will not come to me and believe in me that you may have life, right? So it's not that the evidence isn't there. It really falls back on the willingness of a person to look at that evidence and believe. Uh, that in concert with the Holy Spirit working within the life of a person and working within the, the power of the Word of God that is inspired of the Holy Spirit, God breathed, um, that ultimately leads to the germinating of that seed of truth in the heart of a person. Um, so, you know, to speak more uh, directly, you know, to Vivian's uh, concern, which again, I share and many of you share, we all know people that sort of fit that description that, that Vivian is speaking in regard to those she's referring to. Um, we have to remember that truth matters and it's not just that we're sincere because we can be sincere but yet be sincerely wrong so truth has to matter um, but nobody loves the lost person more than God does uh, it is God's desire that uh, that uh, none should be lost rather but all should be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth uh, it is God who, like Paul said in Acts chapter 17 on Mars Hill, it is God who put people at various times in various places because that would provide the best opportunity for them to seek after him. In other words, he's putting them in exactly the right kinds of circumstances that would give them the best opportunity. Uh, and so nonetheless, even in that setting, without being told to those who were there, there was still a, a, a significant rejection, although some did believe, which is another thing I would point out. Uh, Vivian's case, or in my case, or in many of your cases, you were part of a religious system that was misleading you, leading you astray, leading you down the broad road that led to destruction. Uh, but ultimately you got saved, I got saved. Which means that there is hope for those who are still in those groups. If they are genuinely sincere to know the truth about God, then God will make sure they find out about it. Uh, again, I think we can make that argument for places, again, like, uh, like, like Acts 17 and places like that. It is not God who is not wanting people to come to know the truth. It is us who is who are rejecting. As a matter of fact, Romans chapter 1, right? Uh, what may be known of God has been made evident to them. But nonetheless, uh, they would not believe, but went, went after, you know, false gods or, uh, or even, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff in Romans 1. Uh, substituting for God in that. It's, it's really a matter of a person's genuine desire to be open to the truth when God brings it. Um, so... My, my, my encouragement would be to continue to pray and to continue to take the opportunities to share the gospel. Uh, I'll, I'll share this last story just to kind of wrap this up a little bit. Um, years and years ago, uh, I was a relatively young Christian, but I uh, had friends who were very much into apologetics. And so uh, I've always been a student of apologetics. And so even at that early stage, uh, three Mormons came to the house. And uh, I let them in uh, because I think it's important that we do let them in so that we can talk to them for a couple of reasons. Number one, because the Holy Spirit lives within a believer. And so we have something they don't have. And the Holy Spirit can use us in those situations to bring the gospel to them. Uh, and also on a more practical level, it also keeps them off the streets so that they're not deceiving your neighbors. Uh, again, they themselves may be very sincere about what they believe, but they are misled, they're misguided, they're, they are in fact coming with a message of deception. And so to, to keep them off your neighbor's porch, your neighbors who are less equipped than you are if they're not believers, uh, is doing them a service, I think. And so uh, I had them in, and we got to talking about stuff, and uh, the conversations went on, not just that day, but for a number of conversations, they kept coming back for a while. And I still find myself all this time later praying for them, but in one particular, there's a guy named Elder Johnson, uh, was his, uh, his, his name was Johnson, and he was, you know, uh, in the Mormon system, they're called elders when they come do their missionary work and that. Um, and I still pray for Elder Johnson from time to time. He comes to mind enough. I hope one day I will see him in heaven, but it won't be because he was sincere in his Mormonism. It'll be because at some point the gospel got through to him. Uh, it germinated and brought life and he was saved. Um, so let me encourage you to continue to do that, to continue to pray, to make yourself available uh, to those who you know are in those systems, knowing that you're not the only one that God is using. Uh, but, uh, you know, God loves them, and, and it's very likely that he's working all kinds of ways to reach that person. But he wants to use you and I, too. He wants us to be available 
uh, to be his mouthpiece, to, to demonstrate the love of Christ, as well as to share the love of Christ verbally uh, in the gospel and such. So let me just encourage you to do that, uh, to set yourself to praying for these people by name specifically, and praying uh, directly against the forces of darkness that are clouding their ability to see, praying for the light of the gospel to shine through that darkness, to, to crack through the sky of the darkness in their life, that they would ultimately hear these words of eternal life and believe, even as Jesus and those in the New Testament would speak of, uh, recognizing that it is in fact a spiritual battle. The enemy, the, the wicked one, according to Peter in 2 Peter 5.8, has come, uh, you know, like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Uh, it is he who is the God of this world. It is he who is bringing uh, ongoing deception to cloud the ability of people to see and hear the truth and respond to it. Uh, but God is greater, and he invites us to get involved and to pray and to be available to him to use. But, uh, but do that with a sense of genuine fervency, because this is the battlefield that you and I are called to engage upon. Uh, no one's salvation uh, should be taken, taken lightly. It's not all on our shoulders. We sow the seed, we water, again quoting Paul, but it is God that gives the increase. But nonetheless, he's called us to sow and to water. And so let's be about that. Uh, if you're shy, you're afraid to talk to people, you can at the very least be praying by name against uh, the wickedness and, and such that would, that, would, that would stand in the way and for the light of the truth of the gospel to shine through that and bring life. And so um, let's, let's take that seriously and not as a, a light thing. But Vivian, I so uh, resonate with what you're saying is I too, uh, my heart also breaks for a number of people in my life that, um, that I know need to hear the gospel and receive it. They need to be saved, even though they are sincerely committed to the religious, albeit false religious systems that they're in. Um, so let's pray for them right now. Uh, Father, we want to lift up those who we are thinking of right now, those who we are fully aware of uh, that are in a false belief whether it's in regard to the person and nature of Christ uh, or the triune nature of your very person, of your being, um, or whether it's the gospel itself. In any of these areas where they are misled and deceived, we pray that you would bring clear understanding, that they would come to believe and put their trust in Christ alone and his finished work for their salvation as God who came in the flesh. He was willing and also able to take our sin upon himself and to pay it. Had he been just a man, he wouldn't be able to take our sin upon himself. He would be fallen like we are. But because he is also God, he alone is fully suited and able to be able to take our sin upon himself. The one who is ultimately the, the offended one took our sin upon himself and paid our debt. And so we pray that, uh, Father, they would see that and recognize uh, the beauty of that gracious message and truth. Uh, Father, for Vivian and for others like her, uh, myself and anyone who uh, is longing to see people that we know in these, uh, in these false systems saved, Father, we pray that we might even be able to sort of catch wind of, uh, of, of some of these having come to faith. I pray that I would hear about Elder Johnson having gotten saved. I pray that Vivian uh, would see the names on her prayer list uh, one by one getting picked off and brought into the kingdom, taken out of the clutches of the wicked one. Uh, and Father, I pray the same for anyone else who's watching or listening who's praying the same way for those that they know and love. Uh, but Father, we thank you that the gospel is a message you've sent forth uh, ultimately to conquer the world and, the, and certainly to conquer the, the hearts that have been darkened by sin. So we thank you for these things and we pray that you be glorified in all of these things. Uh, we pray for an ongoing raucous celebration among the angels over each one of these that is saved one after another after another thank you father for your deep and abiding love it is, it is you that hope that so loved the world that you gave your only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life we thank you that jesus is the propitiation for our sins and not ours only but those of the whole world we thank you father that he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Thank you for the beautiful, clear, simple glory of that message that alone can save. So we pray for those who need to hear it, that they would hear it and receive it and respond and be saved. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I couldn't help just thinking, it was on a Wednesday night uh, a couple weeks ago, as we were making our way through Genesis chapter 3, I was just thinking again about the illustration. 
um, as I was praying just then. But um, in in Genesis chapter three, verse twenty-one, after the fall, man, uh, Adam and Eve uh, have tried to hide their sin. They've covered themselves up and uh, attempted to cover themselves and even hide from God. But it is God that pursued them uh, and sought them, and it is He who ultimately took care of how they were to be covered. Uh, their own attempts were not uh, were not worthy of that. They could not cover their own uh, shame and sin and guilt. It was God who had to do that. And therein lies the illustration of the ages, because uh, it's the picture of our attempts to try and cover our sin, our shame, even hiding from God and all of that, but to remember that it's God who seeks us out in our fallen condition. And it is he who ultimately made the sacrifice uh, where, where blood had been shed in that illustration, having covered them with skins, these animals having died in order for those skins to be provided to cover their sin. This principle, this idea of without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. And then ultimately fully uh, recognized and realized in the Lamb of God, Christ Jesus, who came to take away the sin of the world. Uh, all of the religions of the world are, are Adam and Eve trying to cover themselves doing their best to, to cover themselves and hiding from God lest they be found out. Uh, but it is God who pursues the lost sinner. It's God who seeks after the one who has violated and rebelled. And remember, their sin was rebellion. Uh, they had rebelled against God and disobeying him, and, uh, and their fall was the consequence of that. And their guilt and shame followed after that. But it's God who followed after them, seeking them and seeking to make them right with him once again. That's the gospel. It is Christ Jesus who himself uh, covered us in his righteousness, having taken our sin upon himself. Again, 2 Corinthians 5.21. Um, so Vivian, and again, others who are, you know, in the same sort of place, grieving over those who are lost in these things. Uh, it is not God being cruel to, to send people ultimately into judgment. It is rather the decision that people make to reject the means of salvation and to seek it some other way. But even in the illustration, Adam and Eve hid from God. They separated themselves from him. That's ultimately a part of what hell is. I mean, this is the place where you are separated from God. This is the end place that you are ultimately trying to go because you're rejecting the, the fact that God wanted to, to, to save you. In Adam and Eve's case, they got covered. Praise the Lord. We see God's grace in action. Unfortunately, there are those that just continue to run and continue to cover their own sin, thinking it's sufficient. It's not. That's what all these false religious systems are built upon. It is only the light of the gospel that can shine through that and ultimately bring life. So God help us to be able to share that good news uh, because it is truly good news. So uh, Father, we thank you for this. We ask you to give us the strength, the wherewithal, the words in those circumstances, the love in our hearts like yours to share the gospel with those who so desperately need to hear it and certainly especially those who we know that we can be praying for. So thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Pray that the Lord would lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace forever.